Hi, this question is for Dr. Finney. Um, first, I need to tell you a little bit about me. My name is Brenda Zorn. I've been ketogenic four years. I am a former type 2 diabetic. My A1C used to be 12, now it's 5. I do weight training and strength training twice a week and have been for several years. I lift heavy. I have practiced extended and intermittent fasting for over two years now. I do a minimum four-day water fast once a month and weekly intermittent fasting. Recently, I had DEXA scans three months apart and I gained four pounds of lean mass. So this is my question for you, Dr. Finney. If sequential DEXA scans are not done, how is it known from where the protein loss originated? Could it be a marker of autophagy and thus a positive rather than a negative? Excellent question. Um, the first is that whenever you study a group of humans, you never see them all functioning together. You see wide diversity. We see cholesterol go up in some people on a well-formed ketogenic diet and down in some people. And so you have found the right spot for you. But when people say, Steve, what do you do? Tell me what you do so I can do that. I tell them, I only, the only people I give that advice to is my identical twin in my club. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you have found the right thing for you, and that works very well. But uh, as a physician and a scientist, I found that one has to be very cautious about. Uh, as a physician and a scientist, I, I've, I found that you have to be very careful about um, uh, using an N equals one to, to advise other people. Um, and so, I, again, your, your results are, are, are phenomenal and they work well for you. Um, but in terms of trying to find an uh, uh, um, exquis exquisitely sensitive diagnostic tool that everybody can use to find out who it's going to work for or not, we don't have that available yet. Um, right. So it's a, it's, a, it's a goal, but uh, stay tuned. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Shift over to the right. My question is for Dr. Bickman. Um, they're all in regards to carnitine. Um, so the first one is, uh, is there any efficacy in measuring blood levels and following them? The second one is, um, are there any sensitive screening questions that we can ask patients for deficiency? And the third one is, what are any recommendations for supplementing, um, like how and when you would do that? That is a great question. I was asked this by a couple other people to some varying degrees about carnitine. That was clearly something I should have boned up on. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some educated guesses. So uh, I don't know of what I don't know of a quantified um, blood normal carnitine level that would be measured. Mind you, carnitine isn't something we care about when it's in the blood. We want to get it into the into the tissues, into the cells, but nevertheless, there, there must be some level there. But it's made in cells and it's used in cells, so it may be problematic to try to look at it in the blood, but, but I bet there is a level and it's probably pretty well established. My f um, one of the reasons I wanted to mention it, it was almost sort of a last edition, not like Nina's 2 a.m. edition though. <laughs> <laughs> added in there a little longer than that. But, but it was something I added in partly because within the low carb community, I fear that some people engage in kind of bizarre eating just for the sake of getting it, staying in ketosis. And I, I couldn't help but imagine a situation where the person is undergoing such a high degree of lipid oxidation because of the insulin to glucagon ratio, and yet insufficient, and maybe even surpassing their own inherent carnitine production, which we're all, we're all making carnitine, but we make it based on amino acids as well. And I couldn't help but imagine, but perhaps this is, imaginary, but imagine a situation where the lipid oxidation is so high that it's surpassing their own inherent carnitine production and thus creating a bottleneck um, with the purpose of lipid oxidation. And so this may be someone who is in fact issuing, uh, avoiding meat um, for fear of the insulinogenic properties and or um, not eating any meat at all, and it's sort of a keto vegan um, version of that. Um, uh, nevertheless, or someone who's engaging in very high intensity exercise where there is a greater degree of, of, of muscle damage or just tissue damage, which would involve mitochondria and nevertheless a greater need for lipid oxidation. Now, whether there'd be some evidence, 
I, my only guess, like could someone feel, boy, I'm deficient in carnitine. My only thought when you asked that was, would a deficiency in carnitine kind of mimic a deficiency in ubiquinone like what you see when someone's on statins? When someone obliterates their cholesterol production, they can't make enough of all kinds of things. One of those things is an electron transport carry in the, carrier in the mitochondria, and they have muscle pain and, and muscle damage of this rhabdomyolysis. I can't help but wonder, insofar as the muscle has such a need for carnitine, could the muscle be sensitive to a loss and that manifest as muscle aches? But this was a long answer that involved a lot of speculation. So take it for what it's worth. Okay, does that help? Okay. One practical thing on carnitine, if, especially if you're into athletics, is the, if you look at the food charts, red meat is by far the most superior um, enriched with carnitine. So even two weeks, if you have trouble recovering, you're just feeling sluggish, just try to sub out red meat for chicken or fish just for a couple weeks to see how you feel. And I think, as Dr. Finney was saying, everyone's an N of one, and I think your, how your body responds to things tells you a lot. Okay. In, um, in our children on ketogenic diets, we actually do check their carnitine levels yeah. every three months, and there's, there's actually no number that worries us, per se, um, but we actually look at free carnitine, and if it's like less than 10, and they're on valproate, which is a seizure medication which we know affects carnitine, um, and usually the symptoms are that they had good ketosis for a while, and then unexplainedly, they drop. It's so it can happen. It can carnitine happen. Carnitine can be the bottleneck. And they, usually they're, they're fatigued. <laughs> 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 Informed speculation goes a long way. There are, um, there are some pediatric ketogenic centers that put everybody on carnitine, but most kind of do it symptomatically. Okay. So supplement or eat meat? Red meat. Red well, meat. they're eating meat sometimes, but they still drop their levels sometimes. No, I mean, there's interesting, I just want to say that um, because one of the uh, accusations against red meat is that it's the carnitine that causes heart disease, the carnitine in red meat. So there's been interesting uh, that somebody went and looked at all the sources of carnitine. There's actually more, you get more carnitine from various kinds of fish and certain vegetables than you do red meat. I don't know, if, right? Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, two questions. First one is for uh, Dr. Bickman. Um, there's a over here. I can't see anything. Yes, I'm, I'm this way. Uh, the first question, um, there's an argument that later in life people should perhaps reduce mTOR signaling for uh, longevity. And, and so under the conditions that you were showing with the Ig ratios, uh, one under a high carb situation, one under fasting or ketogenesis, would you have any idea whether mTOR signaling would be uh, different under those two circumstances? I knew this was going to come up. <laughs> okay. um, mTOR is such a hot button issue. Um, uh, I, this is all I'll say with mTOR. The general fear of mTOR is because of its role in cancer, right? That can sort of, we can all nod our heads that it's this fear of mTOR's up and that's promoting cancer. But I think that is just a, a massive oversimplification. We know at its core, um, cancer is a mutation. Something, in fact, usually dozens of some things have gone wrong with regards to mutations, and that, and that has caused the cancer. May, could mTOR be part of that once a mutation has happened? Absolutely. But I think it's, uh, for me, uh, a middle-aged guy who wants to maintain muscle, I would, I welcome mTOR, and I'm glad for it, um, <laughs> frankly. But nevertheless, I don't want to have mTOR sufficiently high all the time that I'm inhibiting in autophagy, which mTOR would do. But nevertheless, it is this constant balance in the body, and then we ought to be thankful the system is designed to have this molecule, mTOR, to control when a cell is going to grow or when it doesn't. And to implicate that in cancer, I just think is not fair, because we know it is far more fundamental than just addressing mTOR. There must be some series of mutations that have occurred to allow this cell to grow uncontrollably. And it, could mTOR be one of those mutations? Sure, but that's not, to, that's not the same as saying, I've activated mTOR because of insulin or whatever, and now I'm afraid of cancer. Nevertheless, I don't mean to be flippant about it, but my, my point, mTOR has a role, uh, let's respect it, and I think it's um, overhyped when we are too concerned about mTOR activation and it then suddenly promoting So cancer. you're saying that, that uh, cycling mTOR activation 
perhaps. That's going to happen whether we want it or not. Right. And it's just the nature of, of all of our biochemical pathways. mTOR is up when insulin is. It's down when, say, when insulin isn't, when, when, it's, when insulin's down. I mean, that's simplified, but that really is the gist of it. And so it will naturally be coming up and down. Okay. And I would argue that that's a good thing. Second question is for, for Dr. Finney. This is a follow-on to the first lady's question. Um, I know that Dr. Cahill's data, everybody started from a, a basically a high-carb situation, and then they, then they measured their, their nitrogen losses. And would you expect, and for example, she appeared to be uh, very well keto-adapted from what she was describing, that somebody that's very well keto-adapted that starts a fast, that they would be farther to the right on those nitrogen loss curves? That would be a good hypothesis, but to my knowledge, there's no published data that shows that. Mm -hmm. My guess is that that would be true, but again, that's a hypothesis. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Zabo, I'm a general practitioner in Melbourne and um, also run a clinic for metabolic repair called the Low Carb Clinic in Melbourne. Um, my question's for, uh, first of all, comment for Dr. Kushner, which is um, thank you very much for an inspiring talk, um, inspiring us all about what the future for type 1 might hold. Um, and uh, just something that you quick, quickly mentioned um, uh, made me think of something I came across with a colleague recently, which is that um, empagliflozin um, can increase ketones, you, you mentioned. And um, a, a colleague recently mentioned that he had a, a type 2 diabetic uh, who's on a low-carb diet on empagliflozin who became very un unwell very soon after commencing it and, and was thought to go into ketoacidosis. I don't know how, how true that was, but do you or does anybody else on the panel have any experience with the glyphosins, um having any impact on people who are on a low-carb diet? So, so, so this is a... That one worked. Yeah. This is a really good question. Um, this is a really good question, and uh, it is known that SGLT inhibition will increase glucagon and, the, and, uh, and, and also increases ketones to some degree. And if you imagine that ketones are the biomarker for nutritional ketosis or for, or for a fat-burning state, they're also a biomarker in somebody with type 1 diabetes of a life-threatening insulin deficiency. Right. So we have a fundamental problem there in that if we're measuring or thinking about ketones in someone who is practicing nutritional ketosis or, in, or using an SGLT2 inhibitor, and I didn't really talk about what they are, but what they do is they trick the kidney into dumping more glucose into the urine. So it's essentially dragging sugar out of the body. And in addition, there's an effect on the alpha cell to make more glucagon. So the fear is that people may be uh, sort of insulated from their ongoing development of diabetic ketoacidosis if they happen to be on an SGLT inhibitor or for that matter on nutritional ketosis. If you measure your ketone, if you're not used to measuring your ketones or thinking about it, or if your glu blood glucose is nearly normal, you may not have that elevation that you would normally expect in an SGLT inhibitor. Hyperglycemia is the biomarker for DKA, right? So um, there have been multiple episodes of DKA around the world and even some reported deaths with SGLT inhibition. We're going to need better protocols to understand this. From, from, my, uh, from my perspective, the most important thing is continuous glucose monitoring. And if someone wanted to try an SGLT inhibitor with type 2 diabetes or uh, a nutritional ketosis with type 1 or an SGLT inhibitor with type 1, you're going to need to be able to follow your glucose very carefully. Did I answer your question? Um, uh, yeah, yes, and um, I guess I, I was wondering whether, I, obviously with a type 1, you would never use a, um, a, a, a glucose. I have. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I actually have a, a friend who has type 1 who's also a physician, and, um, and he tried an SGLT inhibitor, and he found that his blood glucoses were much closer to normal all the time. However, what he eventually realized was that it was insulating him from the impact of dietary carbohydrates on glucose flux. And he decided that he had a better chance of actually achieving euglycemia going off the uh, SGLT inhibitor because he really wanted to get his blood sugars down near perfect. And he thought, he figured out that he could get away with eating more carbs on an SGLT inhibitor. 
<laughs> thank you. First, I want to thank you all for your presentation. They were all great. Uh, my name is Julie Carrier. I'm a community family physician in New Brunswick, Eastern Canada. Uh, my question is more for Dr. Finney and Dr. Bickman. Uh, you both emphasize on the need for protein intake on a daily basis. Uh, my question is more how can we distribute these protein to have an optimal feeding? Is it better to eat once a day, twice a day, three times a day, or really it doesn't matter? And also related to that, in case of intermittent fasting, if we go above 24 hours, how do we compensate for the lack of protein? Do we have to double the protein intake on the next day? Or we just forget about these protein for that specific day? I can start by saying, hey, I wish we had studied that in a, in a prospective and careful way. Um, uh, so the, to the first point, um, Nina made an excellent point that the dietary guidelines, uh, you know, that the uh, science behind it says eat three times a day. Uh, and that's, that, that's not been well studied. Um, uh, so I, my guess is that if people, and I know people who rarely eat breakfast um, uh, and then distribute their protein throughout the day and, and have followed a ketogenic diet for years and don't seem to have wasted or been impaired. So each of us finds a way that feels right to us and realize that we've all been, we're assuming, equipped by millions of years of evolution to figure out in trial and error what works right for us. Our software will eventually tell us what's good for us when we get it right. And so try it out and see how it feels. Uh, in terms of ketchup, um, again, we haven't studied whether there's um, a benefit to eating more protein on the day after uh, ending a period of fasting. Um, or you know, if you're doing a, 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 a 5-2 regimen, should you be eating two grams per kilo of reference weight versus 1.5? We haven't been able to study that. Um, Again, I know people who've done intermittent fasting every other day where they only eat a moderate amount of protein at one meal in that day. Uh, and you know, one of the people I'm thinking of is a academic physician who knows you know, if things would be going wrong and he's been doing this for a few years and doing fine. So again, it's a, to a great degree a matter of being aware that there may be problems that would go wrong and seeing how you feel and using your own personal instincts to find the right path until we have the you know, the elegant uh, wearable device that's going to tell you precisely when you're doing right and wrong. And I want to live that long, long enough to see that. So, but off to Dr. Friedman. Well, I would just add, that is a good, cautious response from Dr. Finney. Um, uh, I'm an internist, of course I'm cautious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Stuart, I definitely recommend, look up the work of Stuart Phillips. I think he's at McMaster. Anyone yeah. confirm? Yeah, um, he found in looking specifically at muscle protein synthesis as the outcome that it was better to distribute to whatever degree would work, and I think Dr. Finney's comment on that is, is smart, I think that's prudent, um, that it's better, it's more efficient, the protein is better used for muscle protein th synthesis when it is not one bolus, when it is spread out. He actually also emphasizes the relevance of the evening protein bolus, especially with aging, and it's that over that 12-hour fasted period overnight where most of the protein loss happens, even from the muscle, and so to ensure that that last meal has sufficient protein. But nevertheless, his studies are quite clear that it is better to have multiple boluses, whatever that would be, in, in a normal diet for you or anyone else in the day, that is superior to one. And then I, I like the answer there with the ketchup. Uh, being able to make up a day, there's no evidence on that that I've seen. Okay, thank you. Go over to this side. Yes, hi, my name is Nadia Pataguana. I'm one of the IDM fasting coaches. So I have a, I first wanted to thank Dr. Finney for pointing out that we also believe uh, that, you know, 30 days of fasting or extended fasting uh, can be quite dangerous, most often is. Um, with or without medical supervision, but obviously without medical supervision. My only question, and I'm asking this on behalf of uh, some of my patients that are listening live, is if Dr. Finney believes that um, fasting, water fasting, is, will have the same effect on the body that low calorie diets or starvation diets or the biggest loser diets will have on the body. Uh, the, there's limited data. I have to keep saying that, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we have 
done studies with very low calorie ketogenic diets. And I think one needs to differentiate between ketogenic and not because we now know ketones are a potent epigenetic signal for a number of very important processes in the body. Yes. That we can preserve lean body mass and better preserve resting metabolism when protein is provided in the context of a, as a supplemented fast as opposed to a total fast. Um, but realize also we people vary one from another and you know, there is no there is no perfect diet that, that you know that's you know got, whether it's a guideline or my plate or what I say works for me, that works for everybody else. And so, uh, I think people need to be open to the possibility that there may be some harmful effects with too much fasting. But we will vary one for another in how we handle that. So I think Bob Dylan said it best, and I'm not being facetious here. And I said, don't follow leaders and watch for parking meters. <laughs> And including, don't don't follow me. You know, people say, "What do you do?" I want to do what you do, and I say, "You're not my clone. You're not my identical twin." Sorry, so. the the reason why I'm asking this specifically is because I agree with you about the extended fasting and the dangers of it, right? But a lot of people here do some intermittent fasting or some two or three day fasts. The reason why I'm asking this is because a lot of the examples I used today to show the dam the some of the damaging effects of extended fasting were based on low calorie diets and not on fasting. Correct. Most of the data I showed was on total fasting. To complete fasting, no, no calories taken in. And again, I, made it, I tried to make it clear that I have no, no problem with up to two days of, of fasting, as long as there's good nutrient density in the diet following that. It's when people get beyond two days, and certainly when they get beyond a week or more of, com of total caloric fa d d d uh, uh, fasting that, that I see major concerns on the, the other side, sharp side of the sword uh, showing up. Okay, well, then about the biggest loser contest not being the same as extended fasting, right? Understood. Okay. But that Thank was you. a that was a, a extreme of, of relative caloric restriction. The, the weight loss was extremely rapid, and it involved ex what I think are excessive amounts of exercise. And don't get me into this, but actually high volume exercise in combi combined with caloric restriction has been shown in four inpatient studies to reduce resting metabolism. Got it. So again, yeah. That, more science to be done. Okay. Thank you. Ramon Issa here. I'm a practicing physician from Loma Linda, California, coming to you. Based on my personal experience, my morbid obesity metabolic syndrome is in remission currently since uh, last year, which I'm very happy to uh, experience. But being where I'm working in Loma Linda, Southern California, if you're not familiar, we have a lot of vegetarians and, and a lot of people that are vegan. <laughs> And I'm not one of them, but I have a lot of good friends of mine, physicians and medical people, as well as just family and friends. And I want to get your, so, so, so they've seen my transformation and they're like, what happened to you? you look, this is amazing. And then I don't know what to tell pa people that are uh, vegetarian, but, and I, this was news to me, learning that there are a subgroup of vegetarian healthy people that are very metabolically not healthy. And when you take the time to talk with them and they show you their labs, their lipids, their maybe insulin resistant, they may have prediabetes, but they're the healthy weight. Um, there are some people out there that I think I would like to be able to, you know, sh you know, benefit, but this is all new to me. So this question is directed to the clinical experience in nutritional ketosis, low carb living. Anybody with experience um, making recommendations or healing patients using a vegetarian, borderline vegan approach? And if so, what are your resources and what angle or approach do you use? Thank you. Uh, that, that is an excellent question, and it is certainly possible as a lacto-ova vegetarian to do a well-formulated ketogenic diet with lots of food choices. Uh, and uh, when one gets to vegan vegetarians, it's still possible, but the, the food choices become more constrained. And there are some potential pitfalls there, and I think Nina may, t may comment on, on some of those in terms of um, uh, uh, anti-nutrients within uh, certain food classes. Uh, but um, it's a, a secret I try to hold that I'm a co-author of uh, a book called The New Atkins for a New You, uh, along with Eric Westman. <laughs> Um, they wouldn't let us use the term ketones when we wrote that book. Um, but in there, there's a chapter on how to do a, a, a low-carbohydrate diet, a healthy low-carbohydrate diet as a vegetarian. Okay. 
You're a brave man. I need to commend you for coming. You know, Thank it's, you. It's a tough culture there. That, <laughs> do they know you're yeah. here? That's right. <laughs> I didn't no. know you were at the airport with knives. They weren't going to let mission. him get on the plane. Um, yeah, so a vegan diet I just is nutritionally not sufficient if you don't take supplements. Um, but uh, I don't know if all of you know, Loma Linda University is the University of the Seventh-day Adventists, and it is part of their belief system that people should not eat meat. So, and this is, they've done scientific studies on this, and their studies are, are infused by that bias. Um, so, the only thing I was going to say is that, you know, you recognize that you're surrounded by people who may, this may be part of their religious belief. So, very hard to change that. And I think uh, Steve's idea is a good one, which is to show them how they can get healthier on their chosen diet. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first, thank you for your enlightened uh, talks. Uh, I appreciate it a lot, all of you. And uh, my question refers to what happens after someone has followed a ketogenic diet and then phase out to a different diet. Uh, especially I hear in the presentation from Eric, uh, and I'm very interested from the clinical point of view, what we should take care of and watch uh, in the patients as they go out. So th thanks for the question. Thanks for, for waiting so long to ask us. <laughs> um, we've done some limited studies in some of our pediatric patients who've purposely come off the diet because they don't need it any longer. Uh, very limited studies, um, mostly retrospective, but starting to get some lab data on some of those patients that look quite good. Most of them go back to regular quote unquote foods. Um, they don't have food aversions. That's something the parents worry about, especially at a young age, what impact of a very, very restrictive diet would have on their food intake, but they eat sort of just like every other child can do. Um, but their labs have all looked fine. Their growth catches up. That's, we do see sometimes some growth issues in some of our ketogenic children, um, and that catches up once it's over. Uh, but it's a great topic. Uh, we really just don't know much on the diet or off the diet what the long-term effects are in our children. Okay, and so need more research. And then a second question was about the, uh, the effects of the ketogenic diet in many, in maybe another mental functions, maybe memory or attention. Is there any research about it? That's a, that's a great topic. It's almost a lecture in and of itself. People are uh, extremely interested in neurologic benefits beyond epilepsy. I mean, if you look at sort of neurologists in the medical community, those of us like myself that do epilepsy are this much compared to Alzheimer's, autism, uh, migraines. One out of five people has migraines. Uh, so people are very interested, just like our anti-convulsant drugs work for things other than seizures, maybe ketogenic diets would help other conditions. Um, early data looks very promising for brain tumors, uh, looks potentially promising for dementia, but still very limited data. And some of it is somewhat biased by companies looking at products that may be helpful for it. So we, we need more studies that are unbiased. Um, and uh, a little bit of data on migraine. Some mixed, some say yes, some say no. It's, it depends who you're looking at. Um, but what's I think most exciting to me as an epilepsy doctor looking at all of these conditions is that for almost all of them, cancer, dementia, autism, it's probably different mechanisms. So it, it, for epilepsy may be ketosis, or as I mentioned, it may be for different types of epilepsy, different things. But there's sort of an interesting theory that has been gone around for a while that for brain tumors, the brain tumor itself can't just take uh, the ketones up. It has to be glucose. And that's actually recently been proven not to be the case. So that was a, the original theory was the glucose, you know, pay, being on a glucose diet was the tumors could survive, but on a ketogenic diet they couldn't. It seems to be much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. And so we're learning a lot more as we're going from some of these conditions that could help us in other fields. It's probably multiple mechanisms for different conditions. And I suspect 10 years from now we'll know for some very helpful, for some not helpful at all. Let me just mention quickly that although mice are not really good uh, analogs for humans, uh, there was a mouse longevity study, and it's easier to do a five-year study in mice than it is to do a 120-year study in humans. Uh, but a group at UC Davis, um, the lead author was Megan Roberts, published a paper in Cell Metabolism in September, uh, and they put a mice on one of three diets. One was a relatively high carbohydrate standard mouse chow diet. One was a low carbohydrate but not ketogenic diet with 20% of calories from carbohydrates. And one was a ketogenic diet with essentially no carbohydrates and it was just protein and mostly fat. And they maintained these animals uh, under um, um, uh, controlled conditions and allowed them to live out their lives without pathogens and, 
and other yeah, premature causes of death that wild animals have, like hawks and snakes. And they looked at how long they lived. And the, uh, the two groups with the, uh, the standard mouse chow and the low carb and non-ketogenic diets uh, lived out to a certain point in time. There was this trend to a slightly longer lifetime in the low, low carb, but the ketogenic diet group, group lived 13% longer. And they did not just functional physical strength testing, but also mental acuity testing in these animals. And at 900 days of life, that typical lifetime is 1,000 days, at 900 days, the low carb and standard carb mice showed decline in mental acuity, and the ketogenic mice maintained their useful acuity, and they lived 13% longer. And at death, when they did autopsies, they had one half the number of, of visible cancers at autopsy, primarily uh, um, uh, peritoneal sarcomas. Uh, so it's a, it's, and by the way, they had to bootleg the money to do the ketogenic arm in that study, uh, because the, the NIH they tried twice, and the NIH would not give them money to do this or third arm, and so they found that elsewhere. So obviously a biased study because they came into it wanting to do that arm. Wow, excellent questions. Um, Darla Romp, I'm a nurse and a clinical social worker, but for my sake, I'm also a diet controlled type 2 diabetic. My question is on optimal carb levels um, and maybe optimal fasting windows or durations with the impact on hypothyroid. And I know uh, Dr. Finney, you've said some stuff before on T3 and, and that kind of thing on low carb or ketogenic diet, so I was just wondering if you could address how that might impact when people are trying to do ketogenic and deal with hypothyroid issues. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion done on uh, uh, blogs about uh, does your thyroid need carbs? So Jeff Volek and I wrote a piece and published it on our Verta Science blog on, on that topic. It's not, again, there, you know, there can be much, much better research than what's been done, but it is a common observation that whether one's dealing with a hypocaloric ketogenic diet or a eucaloric weight maintaining ketogenic diet, that T3 levels drop dramatically uh, when one starts a ketogenic diet. T4 levels stay constant, and in a few recent studies, TSH levels stay constant. And what that appears to show, and then Jeff had done a study, um, uh, but didn't include this data in the paper, but he'd done resting metabolism in a, a crossover study for people who were on one month on a high carb diet and then one month on a low carb diet. Um, and the T3 went down dramatically on the low carb diet, uh, but resting energy expenditure stayed the same. So if TSH levels stay the same and resting energy exp expenditure stays the same, what that says is the body is becoming much more T3 efficient, much more T3 sensitive. So we now know insulin sensitivity improves. We never discussed this much, but leptin sensitivity improves. People's leptin goes down, but their satiety stays up, and then T3. So the body's much more efficient in its use of hormones when it's keto adapted. Um, and that seems to be a pattern. So I hope that answers the question. My name is Dr. Kat Kanoski. I'm an internal medicine hospitalist. I work with the cardiology team. Um, so I get to see a lot of patients who come in with an acute MI um, and get to newly diagnose them and be the uh, first person to, uh, first clinician to really address uh, diet, uh, nutrition, and lifestyle changes. Um, so I, I'm really good at getting people off of insulin, type 2 diabetics off of insulin, um, getting them onto uh, uh, different kinds of lifestyle changes um, that are low carbohydrate and our cardiologists are really awesome in supporting us on this. Um, however, I don't know how to do that as, as efficiently with a type 1 diabetic and Dr. Krishner, I was hoping you'd help me. Well, there, a person with type 1 diabetes is not going to come off insulin, right? Right, correct. And ultimately the journey for a person with type 1 diabetes is lifelong and I, I tend to talk about learning around uh, novel forms of nutrition as a sort of multi-step process. And it's silly to imagine that you can just take somebody and immerse them in a body of knowledge and have them say, yeah, I'm all over it. I, first and foremost, you, you gotta have continuous glucose monitoring. And it's been expensive and complicated and hard to get up till now. How, however, that said, there are some cheaper more effective solutions that are coming on the market, including the Abbott Freestyle Libre, which, though it doesn't provide continuous readout with alarms, it gives you continuous glucose readings, and you can scan it. And knowledge is power with, for people with type 1 diabetes. Once you can see your glucose flux, 
and you have somebody encouraging you to understand and put the relationship in between, for instance, the, the, the apple juice that you drink and the huge glucose flux that happened afterwards, that allows you to think more holistically about the relationship between dietary carbohydrate and, and sugars. And then over time, you take people through lessons, right? And they can go from avoiding enriched carbohydrates in their meals, they could try a paleo meal. I often ask families to plan out a low carb weekend. And I say, think of the foods that you love, plan it way beforehand, buy it, cook it, eat it, look at your sugars, and then sit down as a family on Monday morning and figure out if you learned something from the experience. So I guess my question is um, more like when people are, are wanting to do low carbohydrate, wanting to cut their carbohydrates, how do you cut down on their insulin so that they don't have uh, hypoglycemic spells? It's really important that people not be on fixed doses of insulin. And unfortunately, the standard of education in the United States is such that a huge percentage of people who live with type 1 diabetes use the same amount of insulin for every meal. So you're asking a very good question. You, I'm, I had falsely assumed that the patients you're talking about were on insulin to carb ratios and correction factors, and that kind of teaching is essential to then go into these more sophisticated lessons. If you remove carbohydrate without dropping your insulin, you're gonna go low, you're gonna get mad, it's gonna be really frustrating. And by the way, once people go on low carb diets, they very quickly lose weight, and then they need less basal insulin, so we have to be cognizant of that and be able to adapt quickly. All right, we have time for a couple more. It's a little afternoon. Hi, Nina, this is for you. <laughs> You know, when I first came to this country, I was amazed at the creativity of the food industry to create a gazillion food items from four or five ingredients. <laughs> and I'm talking about the, uh, the cereal aisle and the chip aisle. Later on, I came to understand that that was a direct result of the way uh, uh, agriculture is practiced here. And then I understood that it had to do with the farm bill and now I want to know from you, how does the farm bill influence the creation of this food pyramid? Uh, the farm bill is, well, first of all, it, it has an in, it influence, it subsidizes all of those grains um, and crops that they make them cheap, cheap corn, cheap soy, cheap wheat. And so that is, that makes those ingredients more appealing to to put into all the, the packaged foods that we have in our supermarkets. So there are huge subsidies for those industries. Um, we are, uh, we're, not, <laughs> we're not trying to take that on in our work. Um, but the other way that, that the Farm Bill, you know, the, the Farm Bill oversees all the activities of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The USDA is the agency that puts out, together with Health and Human Services, they jointly put out the dietary guidelines. So if we want reform of the dietary guidelines, for instance, if we wanted to say, uh, if we wanted Congress to uh, amend the dietary guideline authorizing language to say uh, you need, you, when you review the science, you need to do it in a rigorous way and according to international standards for systematic reviews, that is something that the Farm Bill could potentially do to put that language in there. The Farm Bill could, uh, Congress could say, we want our dietary guidelines to be nutritionally sufficient. You know, whenever I go around talking, I always say, did you know the dietary guidelines are nutritionally insufficient? That should be illegal. Um, so I think, you know, Congress could make that illegal. So um, those are the two main ways that, it, that come to mind for me. Eric. A couple comments and a question. Dr. Kushner, thank you for your talk. As a creative way to get research uh, done, one of our Duke Endocrine Fellows, Annabeth Barton, did a survey of the type 1 GRIT members yeah. and got yeah. 200 people to reply. And then a Harvard uh, researcher in our area, our space, David Ludwig, said, let's do it again, and verified some of the doctor's reports. And that paper is accepted for publication, should be out in the next few months at a prominent journal. You, know, you can PubMed that. Uh, thank you for your talk. Nina, I seem to remember um, that there was a, I looked to McMaster and um, people like Gord Gaillat, Evidence Based Medicine. Didn't he write a blog about meat as well? 
Did you mention that yes, in the talk? Yes, um, Gordon Guyatt, uh, he wrote a piece that was published in the Financial Times, but it's behind a paywall. We, uh, if you get our newsletter, we, I recently posted that up so everybody could, could read that paper, and it's really about the points that I made, uh, that this decision was based on purely on epidemiology, the IRC decision was based purely on epidemiology, while ignoring the relevant randomized controlled clinical trials. So if you want to look up all that data, that uh, is posted, um, it was on our newsletter. So I, I'll put it on our website. My, my question, Sorry. Dr. Finney, in your talk it seemed like you were giving the connotation that a lowered metabolic rate was a bad thing. Can you comment on that? Do we know that having a lower metabolic rate is truly a bad thing? Awesome question, Dr. Westman. <laughs> if I were Ray Wolford and part of the caloric restriction longevity movement, I would say lower resting metabolic rate is associated with greater longevity. But if you're trying to manage your weight, it's a two-edged sword. Um, so, you know, I, you know, nothing is pure in medicine. Nothing's 100% in medicine. And that's why my talk was not, you know, a one-sided blade, it's a two-sided blade, and we need to keep those perspectives in balance. Uh, but if people are feeling cold all the time and they don't have energy to get up and out of their chair and do stuff, uh, and I've dealt with people who've been on prolonged supplemented fasting, and I did it to, you know, I convert, convert, encourage them to do it, and these are the people who had to wear a sweater to a theater in July because it was, the air conditioning made it too cold for them to sit in the theater and watch a movie. Um, and they, you know, they felt, you know, uh, fatigued and, and uh, cold all the time. And in part, that's, it's not hypothyroidism. We tested for that. It's probably, to a great extent, reduced lean body mass. Um, and again, people, their differential responses. Just be aware that we, some people will have responses that look, feel more negative than they want them to be. If we, if we want to finish with two quick questions, and okay. then we'll, we'll end after that. Yeah, I've go got ahead. a quick one. I'm Richard Morris. I'm a, a podcaster and also an ex-diabetic, uh, reduced my HbA1c from uh, some large number, 11.2 to 5.2. So thank you for uh, everybody uh, on this audience. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but I have a question for Dr. Finney, and it's regarding, uh, regarding fasting and the differentiation between a lean person fasting and an obese person fasting. So a lean person with, say, 10 pounds of body fat who can produce 300 calories of energy for their daily use and somebody with, say, 100 pounds who can produce 3,000 calories of energy for use. My question really is, uh, is that a nuance that's worth mentioning when it comes to fasting? Because the person who is producing adequate energy shouldn't need to recruit amino acids to supplement their caloric uh, use. And plus, they're also able to produce more substrate for gluconeogenesis that doesn't require protein. So would that be a, a, a useful nuance in talking about fasting? As I showed in one of my slides from the study by Forbes and Drenick published in 1979, I memorized that. <laughs> <laughs> they showed that when they fasted lean people, the rate of weight loss was greater and the rate of lean tissue loss was greater. So the obese patients had a, a, some degree of protection, but it was like 20% less lean body mass loss per week of fasting, if you will. And did, did they so say how, how obese they were? Were these obese one, these two, were, These three? were very severely obese okay. patients. Mm -hmm. And these are people they kept on fast for uh, up to 60 days, back in the days when we were allowed to do that. <laughs> right. And you know, the, the side effects of, of that are, are, are such that IRB's human subject approval is, is withheld from people wanting to do that kind of extreme fasting sure. these days. Is there any evidence of uh, the metabolic rate drop uh, for people who have uh, adequate energy uh, from storage? Uh, so, for example, I mean, the people in the Father Girls, Girls study, uh, I call it the Kevin Hall uh, Biggest Loser study because mm -hmm. Kevin Hall himself can't explain the, the metabolic slowdown. If mm -hmm. you ask him, he, he'll say, oh, my model doesn't really explain that very yeah, well. And again, I, in the first set of, of slides, I showed the reduction in resting metabolism in both lean and obese people. Okay. Uh, that, so adiposity doesn't protect one from... So access to energy so, doesn't so protect you from... Correct. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And it's, a, it's an unfortunate uh, reality of the data as currently is, is published. Okay. Uh, thank thank you. you for your questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question. 
than lunchtime. Hi, uh, my name is Bill Erico. I'm a family medicine physician. I'm in a rural area in Washington. So I get kind of the luxury of seeing all ages a little bit more. And so I have a lot of population of geriatrics or, or over 65 year olds that have well-established cardiovascular disease, post-MI, post-stent patients. And they're interested in ketogenic uh, diet, and but there's always sort of a, a conflict with their cardiologists. And you've probably heard this before. My question is, how do you approach these patients in the setting of sort of already taking a statin uh, the current guidelines on medical management of cardiovascular disease once it's established. How do you uh, implement dietary guidelines to this mix? Do you still promote statin use in conjunction with dietary guidelines, or do you try to sway them away from statin use? Um, just wanted to see if anybody had any clinical experience with that of the panel. Uh, Dr. 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 Sarah Hallberg is a uh, a certified lipidologist and is running our study in Indiana on 260 people with type 2 diabetes. She's presenting this afternoon, and I would defer that, that question to her. Um, that when people came into the study on statins, we typically left them on statins. Our goal is to have the fewest conflicts with the primary care physicians. And if we take people off of statins, they're going to say, well, you're changing my, well, we're already taking away the diabetes meds rapidly. Uh, and so, you know, we tried to make as few changes as possible and only do the ones that were necessary, but we'll let her answer that question for you. If you I could uh, chime into this one, too. This is what I do every day at West Virginia University. I'm a hospitalist, family medicine doc, and you always want to embrace their other providers and make sure you communicate, but rarely do you get into any conflict just by getting rid of sugar and junk food. That's a pretty common area, and that makes so many powerful changes. And I think as physicians, you know, our job traditionally and how we've been trained is you know, people look at us for advice and the right answer, like we're supposed to have the right answer. But I think as we all know that that's not true. So I think we just need to just acknowledge and we just be upfront with patients is I can give you some information, but you know, I, you're gonna figure it out. I'm not here to tell you what's right or wrong in advice, but always, I mean, I'm always calling their primaries and their cardiologists when they discharge and say, oh, by the way, we've you know, dropped the insulin and dropped the sulfonylurea. I mean, they, those are the meds that there'll be no controversy of removing because they check their sugars, you know, so it's dangerous to keep them on those meds. And you see in the hospital, it's crazy. You'll see 100 units of insulin go away in 24 hours in the hospital just by controlling what they eat. And, and it's a good experiment. You know, one day, you know, they come in for a chest pain rule out. Tomorrow I'll talk about, we have a low carbohydrate pathway in my hospital that involves all the different services. So I can give a 10 gram carb per meal. You know, the kitchen knows what to do. The nutritionist isn't gonna come in and tell something different. And the residents aren't gonna order sliding scale. You know, so you just basically, if they choose to do that pathway, we don't implement that without informed consent. You say, here's an option, do you wanna try it? And the majority say, yeah, that sounds, I'll do that for a day, I can eat extra meat, extra eggs, extra salad, you know, <laughs> sure, you know, I'm in. And then you see where it goes, but communication's key. My favorite, my favorite are the nursing home patients because you can really kind of more continuously monitor their blood sugars and um, data over time. And I've seen the best results and um, kind of sometimes the kitchen staff really feels empowered at that point yeah, to you go start making the, the bank changes. Thank the kitchen staff. You, yeah. know, you, be, you go down into yeah. the kitchen right, and you right. get to know them by name. Yeah. And if they do a good job, they're the lowest paid employees in the hospital, they're but the you treat impact. them as if they're part of the healthcare team. Yep. Yep. And, and when those patients transition from bedridden to the ambulatory, it's an amazing experience. Well, yeah, I just want to say Dr. Mark does deserve to be called out for this because I think this is the first hospital in the country that offers a low-carb meal option. Uh, and he know. fought really hard for that. So. I think that's is it, it time Mark. for a midday protein bolus? Yeah. <laughs> midday tequila or something, right?